Okay, Rabbi Sai, so this is a little bit of continuation of what we spoke about last week, about conversion. There's a lot more detail to uh, talk about. But I wanted to get a little bit involved in uh, Ethiopian Jewry. Uh, we know that in 1991, a Guinness Book of World Record was broken. Uh, the most amount of people that were ever on a flight happened in 1991. 1,122 people were uh, transported on one jumbo plane. They obviously stripped everything. No seats, no nothing, no overhead. And that was where Operation Solomon. Operation Solomon in 1991 when they brought over Ethiopians from Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, and they brought them over to here. And this is a uh, well-known this, uh, Guinness, uh, this Guinness uh, record being broken. Why it was called Operation Solomon, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but there are many operations. The, the biggest, latest one was 1991, just three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, they brought over 181 uh, families from Ethiopia. It was a big deal. Uh, a lot of money from the Israeli government, millions, hundreds of millions, I don't know how much money has been poured into this project and a lot of uh, philanthropy from Jews all over the world. It's one thing to bring them over, it's another thing to acclimate them to society. This is, that's where the real money goes to, the, the acculturation. Uh, it's not been easy for them, it's definitely not been easy. Uh, even to this day, there are 150,000 Ethiopians now that live in Israel. Uh, not, basically 70 to 60 were born here and 80, 90 were from, originally from Ethiopia, and it's been an uphill battle for them. And uh, they, uh, you'll see soon, they deserve our utmost respect. They deserve actually our utmost respect. You know, obviously Judaism is totally colorblind. Uh, the color of skin is totally irrelevant. Uh, actually, the Gemara in Bechir, that talks about a kind that's uh, black. So, it's irrelevant and there's no, it's superfluous, I don't even have to talk about this. Uh, no place for racism and bigotry and all that stuff. Some of our finest and best of our Sameach have been black and uh, we're extremely proud of them. You know. There's no place for that whatsoever. Sometimes you find in the Jewish community, the, the, the kids don't, it's hard for them to uh, associate with people with different color, but anyone with a half a brain and a little bit of maturity in the Jewish community, on the contrary, has the greatest respect to anyone, uh, to anyone who's black and Jewish, the greatest respect. So, when we deal with uh, the Ethiopian Jewry, a lot of questions that we have to deal with. First of all, the biggest question is, where do they come from? And why are they black? Like I said, we don't care that they're black, but we have to understand, okay, they're Jewish, but how do they end up being black? Is, is that even a question? Or is that not a question? Uh, what type of Judy, are they Jewish? Are they not Jewish? What type of Judaism do they actually uh, keep? Do they um, perform? Is there an issue of Mamzeris when it comes to uh, their uh, Ethiopian Jewry? The Gemara says that uh, a Mamzer Tam Chacham is bigger than a Kayin Gadol Amars. That, that's neither here nor there, but we have to find out their we have to find out about their uh, lineage. So, first off, we have to know that there are two groups of Ethiopian Jews that we have to deal with. There is the majority who remained Jewish up until this day. They are called the Better Be 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 Israel. There was a, and they, whatever practices, we'll see what practices they practiced, but they were extremely persecuted and they remained in Judaism. They would not convert. A hundred years ago, hundred fifty years ago, there was a very small amount of these people called the Falsha Mura who actually did convert. They didn't convert because they want, they didn't convert under duress of death, but they did convert because uh, they were suffering terribly, poverty, and there was famine, and they weren't allowed to own land. So there is a group of Ethiopians that actually did convert in the 
late 1800s, 1900s. Those are called the Fal Shemura. So we have to discuss each group. And the Israeli government, who has a law called the Law of Return, delved, delved into this greatly to figure out if you're Jewish, you have the Israeli government will do whatever they can to get you over. But if they decide you're not Jewish, you ain't, no one's going to give you, no one's going to, you know, whatever your situation is over there, they're not going to fly you over, right? So just remember that these are two distinct groups. The Falashim, now, it's not night, the word Falashim, the Ethiopians don't like you using that word because it's derogatory. And the reason why it's derogatory is because Falashim actually means wanderer. It means someone's at land. Because in the 1500s, they were, they were, they were persecuted. All, all the time they were persecuted. The Christians were always trying to uh, missionize them, always. And they were always persecuted. And there was a law in the 1500s, 1600s that anyone who's Jewish, or better, we'll call them now the better Israel, they can't have land. So they were called, those who would not convert, then almost no one converted, they got the name Falashim by the Ethiopian Christians. But it's a derogatory term. Which again, it means... Uh, uh, wanderer or landless, they don't like being referred to that that way. They like to be referred, so we're not going to refer, we're not going to say it anymore. But I know everyone else says philosophy, philosophy, philosophy. But you should just know that they don't like being called that. There are other reasons why they don't like being called that. So they are called the, the better Israel, right? That's one group. And then there's another group, the philosophy who actually did convert in the late 1800s. Again, it was, it was under duress, not under duress of death, but they, they, they didn't do it because, you know, all of a sudden they had this epiphany and believed in Yoshki. That's not, that's not what happened. It was because they had to improve their very, very difficult lifestyle. And we'll discuss that later on, man. probably not this year. What is their status? Someone who converts under duress of poverty or for very, very extenuating reasons. Okay, those are the two groups. For example, the first group, they were all, t they were all flown over a long time ago. It's the second group we're having a lot of problems. When you hear about the Ethiopians being brought over now, it's the second group of Ethiopians. Those that actually converted. And there's for the Israeli government giving them problems. That's what's going on over here. But the first group, already, already in the 90s, all, they were all shipped over a long, long time ago. Um, now, the two groups are, are related in many ways. Because, again, they only, did, they, they only became Christian 100 years ago. So they're all related. Second cousins, they are related, so they're all advocating for each other. Some are advocating for each other, not advocating, some are not advocating for each other, but just realize that those are the two groups on the ground. The Falashim, again, I won't refer to them that way anymore, and the Falashimura. The word Falashimura means the horse of the raven. Why does it mean the horse of the raven? Well, the horse is obviously derogatory. Jews weren't happy that their brethren converted. Of the raven, because the missionaries that missionized them all wore black clothes. And raven is are black. So what they call the horse of the raven. It's uh, alluding to the fact that they were missionized in the late 1800s. And that's the raven of the missionaries. Actually, one of the biggest missionaries it was was a J Jewish guy named uh, uh, Henry Aaron David. It's like Henry Aaron Stern. He, so he's, he's basically the raven. Okay, but we're getting way ahead of ourselves over here. We're first going to talk about the better Israel Ethiopians. What do they believe? Well, and where do they come to Ethiopia? Well, first of all, they did not have a Torah Shem Alpeh. They only had a Torah Shem Aksav. And they were basically kept a religion called Mosaic. They davened, they davened for Zion. They believed in Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, they kept Shabbos. But they kept quasi like the Kairites. They wouldn't have any fire in their house on Shabbos. They took the Torah literally, right? Like the, the Karaites, you know, you know the whole uh, Karaite community now in Eretz Israel, like between 20 and 40,000 Karaites in Eretz Israel. Uh, they have a Moshav. I mean, they're, they're basically petering out, for better or for worse. But so the, the Ethiopian Jews, the better Israel, kept something like the Karaites, but not exactly like them. It wasn't exactly like them. They had their own um, their own interpretations, and we're going to see soon that's very important to know. Did they come from the Karaites? Did they not come from the Karaites? But basically, they kept a Torah Shebek Sav, it's called Mosaic, without a Torah Shel Peh, but they did daven, they did keep Shabbos, but they didn't have any books, they didn't have a Gemara, they didn't have any Talmud, they didn't have nothing. 
they, they had a chumash. They had a chumash. They had a chumash. They had a chumash. Now, I find that fascinating because Yemen is right next to Ethiopia. I know it's a different continent, but it's right next to each other. It's like a little gulf that divides them. And Yemen, we, we all know that they, they're... They're 100% Jewish, and on the contrary, they're considered, they're considered more authentic than us because they kept the original Hebrew, and they did have a Shulchan Aruch, and they did have a Gemara. They may have not had the Ksais and the Sivis, the famous story that a famous uh, uh, Yemen rabbi came and was, came to Eretz and he was fahered. He got a test by Shmuel Rozovsky. Shmuel Rozovsky is like a big Rosh Shiva. And this famous, I think his name is Rabbi Kapach, he knew Shach and Taz by heart. When they said, yeah, what about the Ksais? He said he never heard of the Ksais. He never heard of the Ksais and the Sivis. But they, they, I, I don't know how it developed that in, in Yemen, they had the Torah Shalpeh, and they were very firm, and no one ever questions the validity of the Judaism. And right across the street, which is Ethiopia, I know there's a river between, it could be the Ethiopian Jews are also behind mountains, but it's not far away. It's not far away from each other. And when it gets to Ethiopian Jews, they have a lot of questions. So let's start from the beginning. Where do Ethiopian Jews come from? Where's the origin? Now this is a big, big mystery. It's uh, very be clouded, very not clear. There are many, many uh, hypotheses. I'm going to go through some of the main ones. And surprisingly enough, you'll see Chazal. When I say Chazal, I mean already from the 9th century. They talk about this, the Ethiopian Jews. But it's going to be a little bit hazy until I put it all together. First, the first place that we, that, that, that we're, uh, the Ethiopian Jews come from is something called the uh, Kebra Nagist. Who knows what the Kebra Nagist is? Sure, the Kebra Nagist is the Ethiopian, I'm not talking about the Ethiopian Jews, this is very important. The National Ethiopian's Book of Legends, Book of Lore. You go to any Ethiopian, you say that Kebra Nagist, they know exactly what you're talking about. It's like, it's not their Bible, it's not a Bible, because they're the, uh, the religion of the religion of uh, Ethiopians are mainly Christian, but they have this type of book. That's like a book of lore. And what does it say in the book of lore? The book of lore says, where does the Ethiopians, Jewish, where does Ethiopian connection to Judaism? Okay? So they say, what do you mean where is it? It's, an, it's, it's, it's open in the Bible. Where is it? They say it's a, we all know Shlomo Melech was at the was considered at, in his in his most glorious stage. He was the king of the whole entire world, right? Everyone from around the world would come to visit Shlomo Melech to see his greatness, to see his wisdom. And the Gemara brings the the the, the Navi brings kings would send would send. Uh, tributes and send them presents and give him money and they would all be dined and wined by him and it was times of Shlomo was, it was people getting their paycheck they, they didn't have to worry about that in the times of Shlomo it says there there was a queen named who Shla Queen Sheba and then went to, Queen Sheba right the famous Queen Sheba she went ahead and she heard that there was some guy named Shlomo and she said, no, let me go visit him. And she comes with a whole entourage. And of course, we know the famous riddles. We know the famous riddles that Queen Sheba presented to Shlomo. And we know that Shlomo answered all the riddles handedly, no problem. And then it says here that Queen Sheba came to Shlomo. But he spoke, she spoke to him. All that was in her heart. Sounds like she got therapy or something. I don't know. And the Yagel Shlemus called the Varel, and Shlomo told her everything. Lawyer Devil Menelik, Shlomo knew to answer all the questions. I mean, before she explained that it wasn't therapy, it was her religious issues. Okay, fine. And then it says that there was a good, big, a, a big goodbye party, a big goodbye party, and she gave presents, he gave presents, and goodbye. End of story. Fine, great, wonderful. But there is a pasuk here. It says, "The Melech Shlaima Nasal Malchus Shva Es Kol Chefsa." The Melech Shlaima gave to Malchus Shva whatever she desired. Oh. Whatever she desired. The 
interpretation based upon this Ethiopian uh, book of legends, what do you think she desired? Shlomo, who else, right? He must have been a handsome guy. That's who she desired. And they actually lived together. So Shlomo and Malkashva on their, on, their, on their last day together actually lived together. Now, how strange this sounds. Actually, Rashi brings, uh, brings in parentheses there from the Arizal. A similar, a similar shot. How does Rashi bring it to the Arizal? That's a good question. <laughs> what do you have to the Arizal? You have a question, how did Rashi bring it? Oh. Anyway, that's a good question. So you're right. Excellent. Pinchas is a, a historian here. He happens to know that Rashi lives way before Arizal. So it's actually in parentheses over here. In parentheses of Rashi here. It says here, Baleha Nebuchadnezzar. That Shlomo lived with her, and from that union, Nebuchadnezzar was born. Okay, now obviously, if you do the math, Shlomo lived like 400 years before the first basement was destroyed. Who destroyed the first basement? Maybe Nebuchadnezzar. He would have been a pretty old dude if he had been around. If he would have been around 40 years later. So whenever you learn about Rizal, you, you, you don't know. You don't know exactly what he means. You don't know if he means. Oh, well, yeah, it doesn't mean that Nebuchadnezzar was born directly, but it's a, it's a descendant. You don't know if it means that, well, it means that because Shlomo did something with Malkashla, so spiritually up there in the world, that's why Nebuchadnezzar came to be. You don't know if it means that it, Shlomo didn't even live with her. It just means that he shouldn't have had any, he, he got maybe too uh, friendly with her. You don't know. And like Pinka said, it's in parentheses. Now, the, I am, I'm sure the, the, but, the, the Keber Nagis have no idea about this Rashi. Uh, but, but, and they, they're, not, they're not quoting this Rashi or this Arizal, obviously. Uh, the Keber Nagis obviously precedes the Arizal. They don't know how old it is, at least 700 years old. But be it as it may, there is a teeny bit of a source in, in the, in the, in the uh, Navi, at least from this Rashi, that, that, that Shlomo did live with Shiva. Now, there's a little bit of a problem with this. Because the famous Gemara Baba says, anyone who thinks that uh, Sheba was a woman is a mistake. Sheba wasn't a woman. Malka Sheba means that the kingdom of Shva, right? Now, even nowadays, I don't think we could get a man pregnant. I mean, I don't know what's going on. I been a, right? So this is a little bit of a problem, right? It's a little bit of a problem if, uh, to say that Malka Sheba was a man. Right? How did she get pregnant? But the truth is, the Masha there says, you, you miss other things in the Gemara. Because also, even if you forget this Rashi, you know, this legend that uh, Shlomo lived with, uh, lived with her. The whole entire, the whole entire uh, Navi here, the whole park, is referring to her as the feminine. The whole entire time is referring to the feminine. It's Ashashala. So the says, you're misunderstanding. It doesn't, the Gemara didn't mean when it says anyone who's a Makashua is the Isha is wrong. It doesn't mean Anyone who says that she's a woman, it means anyone who says that she's a wife. I Meaning, don't think that Queen Sheba was a queen based on the fact that she married a king. No. She ruled on her own stead. I mean, like Queen Elizabeth. You know Queen Elizabeth? She lived to 120. She ain't a queen because she's married to a king. Who's her husband? Uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, right? He ain't no king. So just like Queen Elizabeth is a queen, I understand she got it from her father, but it's on her own stead. It's not because she was married to a queen, a king. Do not think that Malka Sheba was married to some king, you know, and she was like some type of secondary, like, 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 like you know, the first, the first lady. No, no, she wasn't the first lady. She was the president. She was the queen on her own stead. That's what the Gemara means. So good, we got it, to, we got it back to be a woman, okay? So, so, what, so what does it say over there? So if you open up this, uh, if you open up this book, the Kebra Nagist, which I did actually, you know, right, I opened it up. So what does it say there? That sure enough, Shlomo lived with Shiba. Now, as crazy as this may sound to us, it, we do know that Shlomo married a thousand women. We do know that, right? So what? So I'll tell you it's another one, so it's a thousand and one. So what do you, right? It's so, oh, it's not so possible. Why in the world would Shlomo marry a thousand women? Right, he was a smart man. You figured, you know, what was, it, what was going on in his head to marry a thousand women? But it's clear, it's clear like day what he wanted to do. Ariz already says this. It, it, it wasn't because he was some type of philanderer or something. It had nothing to do with that. He was, he, what, he had a plan. 
he was, it was for political reasons, but not just political reasons, it was for religious reasons. His goal was to connect himself with the whole world, hopefully to have kids from these thousand women. These kids would be very firm, go to Mir, go to Brisk, whatever, send them back to their mother's land of origin, get the whole world to at least be monotheism, if not totally Jewish. That was his plan. His plan was to get everyone to be at least Shem at least, Noach, uh, or maybe even Jewish. That's what, he was, that's what his goal was. And the Rambam famously says, now I want, we, we were supposed to do this Rambam last week, the Rambam famously says, Al Yara Daitcha Shimshan Hamashia Sisro. Don't think that Samson Shimshan, the savior of his soul, a Shloima Hamelech his soul, Shinikri Yadidya. The Shloima Hamelech his soul is called the, the, the friend of, the, of Hashem, Nasu Nashim Nachoris Bigayusan. Married a Gentile woman while they're going. Chasm Khalila, heaven for friend. You, you can never say such a thing. He says there openly, any woman that Shlomo lived with, a thousand or a thousand and one, whatever it is, they all became Jewish. The problem was, Shlomo misread the women. He thought that they were actually into Judaism. And what we learned last week, a lot of become a gear in order to marry someone? No. You're not going to become a gear for a two motives. Shlomo sort of misread these thousand women. And the gear is the gear. So what we learned last week? If you have 100% Kabbalah from Mitzvah, it doesn't make a bit of a post facto, it works. So Ram says in black and white, post, the shores they were Gerim. And the shores, post facto, the sure all South women were considered Gerim. It's just, Shlomo should have done it because he misunderstood their, their, their intent. He thought that they were on board, yeah. We're going to have kids, we're going to send them out to Brisk, and then uh, we're going to send them out to the whole entire world. But that wasn't their intent. What were they interested in? Shlomo's money. So, but what is May? We're not, we're not going to go there right now. Shlo, it says here clearly that um, any woman that, that uh, Shlomo married was Jewish. So here we go. Says the uh, Kebernagist, Shlomo lived with Sheba. Sheba is now Jewish. Because there's no way someone lived with her if it's not Jewish. And they had a kid. What's the name of the kid? Menelik. Menelik. And Menelik actually went to, back to Ethiopia. Of course, if you read the, uh, that book, it says he took the Oren with him. Somehow or other, they, he got the Oren. And that part is a little bit fuzzy. And he was like, sort of like a superpower guy because he had the Oren with him. Until this day, by the way, if you go to the Ethiopian church, when you go to any Ethiopian church, it's built like a base of They have three sections. They have a Kaddish Kaddashim. They have a, a Kaddish. They build, they build a church on the model of the Michigan. And in the Kaddish Kaddashim, they, some, most of them have a, a replica of an Oren. They have a replica of, a, of an Oren in the Ethiopian uh, churches. But being there the May, this is what it says. So there's a Sheba married Shlomo. And Menelik came back to, uh, Menelik is Jewish. It says there in the Kebernabit that he went back to visit Shlomo and Shlomo taught him some Torah, it says there. And he came back uh, to Ethiopia. And now we understand everything. Why, if this is true, why are the Jews black in Ethiopia? Because their mother, their great, 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 great grandmother was Queen Sheba. We could assume that she was black. Right? That's what we could assume. Right? She came from there. So this is what it, this, this is where, this is, could be the origin of Ethiopian Jewry. Now, I saw, I saw that, I thought that was pretty funny. There's a, Shashir Shim is the Holy of Holies, Kaddish Kaddashim, and, but it's, it, ostensibly it looks like a love song, or love poetry. There's a famous pasuk here, Shechira Nivanova. I'm black and I'm beautiful. So someone interpret that's talking about Queen Sheba. That Shlomo was writing a love song. I mean, this is, I really shouldn't be even saying this in public. But I just thought that was pretty funny. I'm black and I'm beautiful. So they say, oh, who is this referring to? Clearly it's referring to Queen Sheba. But this is obviously, uh, I just got a kick out of that because I thought that was pretty funny. But even, even if you don't have Rashi there, you know, everyone, Rashi explains that it's a love song between God and Israel. It's not a real love song between a man. And it's just, 
It just says the trappings of a love song between a man and a woman. But even if you just look at the psukim there, it doesn't, it doesn't really flow that, that it's talking about. <laughs> if you look at the psukim there, it seems that she was complaining that she was black. Her skin wasn't black, but she was complaining that she was ashen because she was an exile. So shkari vaninava doesn't mean I'm black and beautiful. It means even though I'm black. Again, black doesn't mean he has a color. It means that she's downtrodden. I just thought that was pretty funny that they made that reference that shkari vaninava is referring to Queen Sheba. So this is number one. Now, we're going to get back to this, but I want to make this extremely clear. This is written in the Ethiopian National lore in their legend. This has nothing to do with, with, with Gemara, Chazal. This is what is written there. We're talking about the whole Ethiopian country. All of them. We're not talking particularly about the Ben Israel. We'll get back to that soon. Fine. Another story, which is cl- which we'll see if you interview the Ben Israel people, they'll say, what are you talking about? Shlomo, Sheba, Hakmus the Chinese. We come from Moshe Rabbeinu and from Dun. We're from the son of Moshe Rabbeinu, took Shevet Dun, and came to Ethiopia sometime in the round time of the Exodus. You're like, huh? The son of Moshe Rabbeinu took the Shevet of Dun and didn't go to Eretz Yisrael and they went to Ethiopia. You know, the first time I read them, I'm like, wow, where's that coming from? But then I started thinking, and this is my Kiddush. If, if, you, if, you go, if you go Wikipedia on, on the Ethiopian Jewry, one line, they say there, every single rabbi, every single historian has a different interpretation, and everyone feels they have to add something weird. Like, so this is, this is, this, this is a minor chiddush a little bit. So the truth is, how strange it has this may sound, if you just look at, if, you, if you're familiar with some of the stories in the, in the, in the Chumash, uh, you can put a couple things together, and it could be. I mean, obviously, I don't believe this, but... First of all, last week's parasha, or two weeks, depends on, two weeks ago, depends on uh, where you are. He has a famous story. It's a black and white of the Chumash. It's a black and It says, Moshe married a Kushis. I mean, Kushis can mean African, it can mean Ethiopian. It says black and white. More, more black than white. It says here that she married a Ethiopian. Or, 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 it's right there. So we all know that Rashi says, what? Moshe married a black woman? What is this talking about? And what is Miriam so upset about? So Rashi says right away, no black women, none of that. It was, it was talking about Sipora and Moshe separated from Sipora. And why is Sipora called Kushis? Because she was, because it was, she was perfect. Or it's like, sort of like saying a euphemism that she was so, they didn't want to give her an eye in horror. So, it says that she was, she was beautiful, like something clearly is black. It's talking about Sipora, right? And it's talking about, and what was their complaint? That why did Moshe divorce her? Now, the super reading of the post positive doesn't say one word about divorce. I mean, that's, that's, that's reading a lot into this. I mean, this is Chazal, so I'm not, I'm not questioning it. It's not, I mean, I'm just saying. Again, Miriam spoke to Aaron about the Ishakushis because she t- he took an Ishakushis. A, Kush is referring to Tzipora, okay. But it doesn't say one word about divorce. Not one word. It's like, whenever, whenever I get to my life, I'm like, wow, this is, this is reading a lot into it over here. The truth is, you know, you can't say anything, but truth is the Rashbam and the Tagi Yonis of Benuzil. They're like, no, that's not Pshat. It has nothing to do with Tzipora. They bring there, it says, we have a book called the Divrayam Moshe, and that Moshe was the king of Ethiopia, or Africa, and I don't know, Kush can mean anywhere in Africa, for 40 years, and he took a queen, a black queen, we'll see soon what that means, he never lived with her, so he never uh, consorted with her, and they didn't know they didn't know, and they thought that he was still living with his black queen. You hear Hester Misa? You hear what to say? That they said Moshe Rabbeinu was living, they thought he was living with the black queen, and that's why they spoke Lush and Har about him. And Rashbam says they didn't know that he wasn't living with her. I mean, Rashbam doesn't deny that 
he had a black queen. They just didn't know that he was living with her. And says the Rashbam, you know what? This is the main shot. He brings Rashi shot. He says, you know, this is Rashi. You're reading way too much into. Uh, you're reading way too much in the pesukim over here. And Rashbam is who? Who's the Rashbam? Rashi's grandson, right? This is Rashi's grandson, right? So we do have a source that Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, where does this come from? Where in the world does this come from? That Moshe Rabbeinu got married to a black queen. The truth is. Oh, 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 oh. I, I, yeah, very good. <laughs> Micha, very good. Yeah, you can't have a child if you don't consort, usually. That's the way it works. Yeah, that's not the point. My point is to show that this, that, the East, that, there's, a leg, that there's a hypothesis or that the better Israel believes this, it's not coming from nowhere. It says here, according to Rashbam, Miriam herself, her, Miriam didn't know. Miriam thought that Moshe did consort. That was her Lashon Hara. Miriam said, look, Moshe's hanging around with a black queen. The lead of Israel should be doing that. Again, I, I don't know what her problem is. He, even then, I don't know what, exactly what her problem was. And, and yeah, so he was hanging around with the black queen, so what? It's not clear exactly what, what the problem is. But, but So we have here a little bit of a safer called Dirve Yomim of Moshe. Now, I don't know if this thing exists anymore, but it's brought down in the Yalkut Shemaini. Yalkut Shemaini, everyone, uh, everyone learns the Yalkut Shemaini. It's a compendium. I see the word Yalkut means a compendium. From, uh, from I forgot the rabbi's last name, Rabbi, rabbi Shimon, and uh, he brings here a whole story, a whole story here, and it says over here like this. It'll take a while to go through the whole thing, but it's pretty fascinating. We all know that there were three advisors of Paroi, and Yisroi was one of them, and Yisroi told Paroi, "Leave the Jews alone." So Yisrael had to run away, and it says here Yisrael got the stick. Which stick? The, the Matemoshe. Somehow or other, Yisrael got it because the, the staff of Moshe was already the staff of other Marishan. And Yosef had it, and when Yisrael ran away, he ended up with the Matemoshe. Fine. And Bilam, we all know Bilam, what was his a, a counsel to uh, the Parah? Yeah, kill the Jews, sure. Throw them in the water, that's the way to do it. Fine. When Moshe got older, Bilam heard uh, that Moshe wanted to kill him. Right? Again, Moshe is now a, right? You remember the story? He's an Egyptian prince right now. But Moshe knows he's Jewish and he knows who Bilam is basically. Who he keeps repeating saying here Bilam was loving. This is a whole sheer on its own, whether Bilam was loving or not. So so basically, Bilam and his two sons run away. And they come to a place called Kush. And they become friends with the king of Kush, whose name is Kuknos. K Kuknos. And Bilam and Kuknos are good friends. And Bilam tells Kuknos, yeah, it's a good idea to go out for a war. You're for sure going to win. Kuknos goes out for this war. And basically, he with his army. And uh, Bilam tells the city uh, dwellers, the people who stayed in the city, let's revolt. Make me king, make me king. My sons are going to be the two, uh, you know, the two governors, and we'll basically lock Cookness out of the city. And that's what he did. So it says here that he made, the, he, on two sides he made walls, on a third side he made a moat, and the fourth, fourth side they were uh, he, he created snakes and scorpions. And sure enough, Cookness comes home after he succeeded his war. And he's like, wow, look, this is, I'm reading the Shemayani, this is a very famous book. He says, wow, look, they did renovations over here. This is amazing. And when he knocks on the door, he says, okay, I'm home. They wouldn't let him in. Cookness says, what's going on? Well, they wouldn't let him in. They wouldn't let him and the army back in. Fine. And then Cookness realized that Bilam did all this. And basically... He tries to enter the city from the first side, from the second side, from the third side. He can't get it. He can't get it. Meanwhile, Moshe Rabbeinu, we all know, had to run away from power. And he somehow or other ended up with this army of Kukunim, which is not, you know, Ethiopia is right next to Egypt. It's not that, it's not right next to, it's not that far away. And if Moshe was a refugee, 
and this basically cooked this army with basically refugees because they were out of a they were out of their city. It could be ended up over there. Because of May, the King Cookness died, and they were very worried, the army was very worried, and they decided to make Moshe the king. It says here that Moshe was exceedingly handsome, exceedingly tall, and they made him king. And they said, Moshe, what should we do? We've been out, we've been basically out ousted from their city for nine years. They were laying siege, they were laying siege for it for nine years. They couldn't get in. So most of them, no problem. I want all you guys to go to the forest and catch a certain type of bird. A uh, chasida, some type of bird. And train it, train it to be like eagles. And they said, why? Okay. And they did that. So they had this whole army of birds. And most said, okay, for the next three days, I'm not making this up, I'm not making this up. The next three days, Moshe says, don't feed the birds. Do not feed the birds. They said, why not? Trust me, don't feed the birds. Fine. After the third day, he said, okay, everyone get ready. We're going to attack the city. Bring the birds. They went to the side where all the snakes were. And since the birds were all starving, they ate all the snakes. So they were, that was the way that they were able to infiltrate the city through the birds eating all the snakes. And lo and behold, they successfully uh, breached the city and they came back home. Kukinus didn't come back home, he was dead, right? But Moshe came back home. So everyone was so joyous. You know, they killed the uh, insurgents, you know, they killed the people who revolted. And they decided they could make Moshe king. A card to toys, a little gratitude. And now they decided to make Moshe king. They said, we're giving the old queen, Kukinus' old wife, we're giving to Moshe. So now when you see what the Rashbam and the Tagi says, when they say Moshe married a queen, they mean Moshe married a queen. She, he married the previous king's wife. Fine. That's, that, that's what, this is it, right? Now, after 40 years, 40 years it says here, Queen Kokonis went over to her, went over to her people and said, you know what? This Moshe guy, this Moshe, he never lived with me. He never touched me. I'm getting, I've been waiting 40 years. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a little impatient over here. And Moshe, this Moshe, he never bowed down to any of our idols. Let's get rid of him. And you know, 40 years later, so everyone forgets previous uh, favors. And they said, okay, we're getting rid of him. And they threw him out. It says they wanted to kill him, but they were afraid to kill him because they did have some gratitude toward him. So 40 years, this is like 40 years, it says here that Moshe was king somewhere in Africa. And, and what? And he was married to a queen, a black queen. He said he never consorted with her. It says that he ended up being, um, he ended up being by uh, Ruel, he ended up by Yisrael. Yisrael was wary of him and he put him in jail for 10 years. Yeah, well, that's, that's some type of father-in-law. He put him in jail for 10 years. Sipora secretly fed him. I mean, Yisrael put him in jail for 10 years without any food and drink. Uh, and Sipora secretly fed him the whole time. After 10 years, he said, oh, you know, I, I actually need an extra room. Let me go see where that room where I put Moshe. And he opens the door and he sees Moshe's alive. And he's like, oh my gosh, how are you alive for 10 years? He doesn't tell her that Sipora, his intended wife, his soon-to-be wife, fed him. And I don't know why, it seems Moshe wasn't too upset at Yisrael. I don't know exactly, that part of the story is a little bit hazy to me. And uh, Yisrael invites him into the garden, and lo and behold, there's a staff stuck in a rock. And Moshe says, wow, what's this staff? And he just picks it up. And Yisrael is just totally amazed. Why? Because that was a staff of Moshe Rabbeinu. Which, uh, it goes through the Yaakov Shmoini, it was from other Marishan, and the Marishan gave it to Yitzchak and Yaakov, and ended up with Yosef, and, Bil and Yisrael stuck it in a, in a rock, and no one could pull it out. Meaning, yes, Sephora was on the uh, Shidduch market for a long time. She was on the Shidduch market for a long time, and the test was if ever could pull out this staff would get Sephora, and no one could do it. I don't know, I know it sounds a lot like King Arthur and uh, King Arthur over here, you know, you know who took it from who, but 
anyway, but be it as it may, Moshe just took it out, and you said, amazing, no can take out this, right? And this is a staff of Moshe, right? Adash, but right, this is, this is a staff of Moshe. This is a story in Yag Shmoni, and I have, I have summarized it. So, so, step one. We have here that Moshe had a queen. That was, that was Ethiopian or, or of some sense, of some sense, uh, at least black. And, and, and Miriam was talking a lot to her about that. Now, I'll be honest. I don't understand exactly the Rashbam still. Okay. Moshe had a black queen. Miriam didn't know that he, didn't, he never lived with her. And Miriam saw that he was acting properly. But it seems that, that according to the story here, the queen threw him out, which says there openly when he was like 60 years old. What is Miriam talking about this 25 years later? How does this end up 25 years later? Miriam also says, Iron. Oh, you remember Moshe? Well, 25 years ago, he had a black queen. And let's say he did that 25 years ago. I mean, that was before Harsinai. It's not clear to me what exactly they're spam learning. Why they're complaining about it now. If it's the poor, it makes sense. Right now, he divorced the poor. Uh, it's not clear. Maybe, maybe, maybe once Moshe, you know, maybe she threw him out. And then a couple years later, when he saw Moshe was like a big deal, yeah, he said she gave a call. So Moshe, I'd like to come back. And Moshe, being the nice person, he said, "Okay, you can come back." You know, maybe that's what it was. It's not clear to me. It's not clear to me. But it definitely is a. It definitely says here, Moshe Lachach Isha Kushis. Now, but what does this have to do with Don? And it doesn't have they had any children. Oh, so this is. Uh, if you know a little bit of Navi, there's actually a story in Navi with Don and. Moshe's grandchild. If you know the story of Pesel Micha, what's the story of Pesel Micha? I can't go to the whole story now. But basically, there was a guy named Micha who made an idol. Uh, and this is, by the way, in the beginning, right when they came into Eretz Yisrael. Even though it's uh, put at the end of Shoftim, but Rashi said this actually happened very early on. And one day it says here, it says here, there was no king in Israel. And Shevet had done him in The Shevet done couldn't find a place to settle. Uh huh. Shevet done was wandering, looking for a place to settle. And sure enough, they meet up, they come across Pesel Micha, and which is a, an idol. And who was the Chief priest of Pesel Micha. Who was it? Who? You know, you got, you got a, you got a Pesel Micha, that whole temple, and you got to have a priest. So this is hard to believe. Yoyvisen ben Gershon ben Moshe. Moshe's grandchild is the priest of this, of this, uh, in this temple. Now, I'm sure you're all asking, how is it possible? Moshe Rabbeinu's grandchild is serving idolatry? And now he's serving, he's the priest? So we all learn the Gemara Babasa. The Gemara Babasa talks about this. But that, that's what it is. You know? Nowadays we complain about it's hard to uh, raise kids. <laughs> if, if my, it looks like Moshe men have difficulty over here also. I mean, I, you know, you can't say these things, but <laughs> that's what it looks like. His own grandchild is serving Avoid Azar. And what does it say there? B'nai Dun, who are looking for a place to live, decide to steal Pesel Micha. There's a guy named Micha. He makes this Pesel, a whole story. B'nai Dun walk in one day and steal it. And then they see this a priest on the side. They say, hey, why don't you come to us? We'll pay you a lot more money. He says, yeah, that's not a bad idea. So Yonison Ben Gershon Ben, uh, Yonison ben, Gershon ben, ben Maisha, who was a lady, they were very impressed by that, went with Dunn. He, they, he went traveling with Dunn. And uh, it says over there that he traveled with them. And the Pasuk ends off over there that he was with them, or at least his, uh, at least, uh, his family, 
until they left Eretz Yisrael. So, obviously, I don't... I'm just trying to show, if you, someone, if you, if you talk to the uh, Abed Israel, they say, yeah, sure. You know, we come, we come from Dun, who sort of got together with Moshe Rabbeinu's son and sort of left Eretz Yisrael, or they, they say right after the Exodus. If you put a bunch of things together, it's not so far-fetched. Moshe was married to a, a, a Kushis. They could clearly say that maybe Gersh, this grandchild came from that, um, that, that uh, connection. So maybe he was even black. And it says it clearly that he connected with Dun, right? But it's just, obviously I don't believe this is true. But I'm just trying to show you, this is my Kiddush. This is my Kiddush. You know, like Kiddush and Ksois and the This is my Kiddush. This is where it could be where this legend come from. So we have here, we have here two possibilities so far. Again, comes from uh, Sheba and from uh, Shlomo Melech. Two, Moshe, Don, and this is, the, they ascribe to this. Now, what does Chazal have to say about this? And if you ask the other better Israel, what do they say? They say, yes, we come from Don. We come from Don. That's right, we come from Dun. But they don't say that they, they don't say that they come from the son of Moshe Rabbeinu and what I said. What they say is based on the famous Eldad Hadani. Who is Eldad Hadani? Eldad from Dun. In the ninth century, in walks in out of nowhere a, a, a fellow of dark skin who spoke a funny Hebrew, funny dialect. And he comes in, we're talking about the ninth century, we're talking about Rashi's time, even before Rashi's time, we're talking about the, a little bit, uh, almost the time of the, um, of the Gaonim, and he just walks in out of nowhere. And the, the whole place is shocked. It seems that like the guy is very charismatic. And they say, Elder Hadani. Everyone knows Elder Hadani. They say, who are you? Who is this masked man? He says, what do you mean, who am I? I come from Ethiopia, that area, and what they call Chabash, even nowadays they call the Ethiopians a Chabash, and he had a lot of sperm, he had a lot of books, we'll see about that soon, and I'm going to quote what he says, we have, this is Elder Adani talking, we have a Kabbalah, Ishni Piish, Shanak Nebnei Dun, we have a Kabbalah from, from your, that we are from the son of uh, Bnei Dun, yeah, how do you end up in Ethiopia? Well, when there was a civil war between Yeruvam and Rechavim, we know a little history in Navi, after Shlomo died, there was sort of a, there was sort of a schism. The ten tribes and the two tribes. What happened? Rechavim became king. He's the son of Shlomo Melech. And he was a little bit tough. And they asked Rechavim to be a little bit easier than Shlomo, because Shlomo took a lot of taxes. Push comes to shove. Ten tribes secede. Leave, leave the union. So it's ten tribes against two tribes. That's why we had the lost ten tribes. Because they actually set up two separate governments. <laughs> you think we have, a, you know, the, the government just fell. You think we had problem in our days? It, it's been going on for a long time, this problem with coalition. It's been going on for a long time. So there's been a, there was a, a, a and who became the other king? Yerav ben Nevat. Yerav ben Nevat became the king of the ten tribes. And we know Yerav ben Nevat was at one point the big tzaddik, but something went a little bit raw, awry over there. I don't, I can sit in for an hour and talk about that, what went awry. But basically, says Elder Adani, when Yerav ben Nevat became the king of the ten tribes, we all know he set up fictitious temples. He said, I'm the king of the ten tribes. I don't want my ten tribes to go to the base of English. That belongs to Yehuda. So he made up his own. He made up his own. Uh, he made up his own temple, right? One was in Dun, by the way, and one was in Beersheba. Dun was always up north, not south. And the ten and Dun said, or a group of Dun said, so it says here, when you're up in the vault, Hichti is Israel, Machtiul, 
This is so also Schneegel is of what 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 was in the temples? What was the centerpiece of these temples? Two calves, right? Reminiscent of the eagle, right? Two calves were in these temples. And and there was gonna be a war. And the group of Dunn said, why should we fight? Why should we be involved in all this mess? We're out of here. And they decided they're leaving Eric to throw because they didn't want to be invited in the political mess. They didn't want to fight with Rechavim. They didn't want to have anything to do with Yerovim's temple. And it says there, besides we decided to go back to Mitzrayim, but not to go to Mitzrayim the way we originally trans, uh, transversed because of the Isn't to go back to Mitzrayim. We just we went a different route and we decided at the end to go to Kush and we came to Ethiopia and it was a beautiful place. Kromim Gino Sephardesim and that's where we stayed. This is where Elder Hadoni comes about and says this is where we Ethiopians come from. So interesting, a lot of people say, oh yeah, they're from the, the Lost Ten Tribes. He's not saying they're from the Lost Ten Tribes because the Lost Ten Tribes happened 150 years later when Sancheriv attacked Eretz Yisrael and only Yishalayim was saved. He's saying that from the times of Shlomo meaning it's very similar to the time zone at the same time. The Negba, the, uh, that book says, is when Shlomo consorted with Sheba. They're saying at that time, right after Shlomo died. So it's not really the 10 lost tribes. It preceded that 150 years. Now, a boy side. Elder Hadani, does anyone accept him? Some random guy just walks in out of nowhere. You know, like, just walks in and says, hey, I'm here. And like, literally, he took the Jewish world by shock. So, who, well, you'll be, you'll be amazed. Everyone quotes his, everyone quotes him. Rashi, Toysvith, the Rosh, <laughs> they're all quoting Elder Hadani. They're all quoting him. Why are they quoting him? The first Toysvith, Oba Bechulun, Oba Bechulun, the first Toysvith and Bechulun quotes Elder Hadani. And over there it's a debate about whether uh, women are allowed to do sheet or not. Elder Hadani had a shita. Elder Hadani came with his own books, his own halachas, and they quote him. Semech Goyim, the Goyim of Surah, was asked, can we rely on Elder Adani? He said, you definitely can rely on him. So it seems that he was pretty well accepted. So this is the first, now, the Ibn Ezra, this just happens to be by chance. By chance, what is happening is the Ibn Ezra is talking, this is a total coincidental. I find it amazing. He is talking about that story that I told you a couple minutes about Moshe Rabbeinu, whole Thai story, which is called Divrei Yom Moshe. There was some book called Divrei Yom Moshe. I don't know if it exists anymore. He's talking about that story, about that book. And he says, Vashikosim uh, Divrei Yom Moshe al Whatever it says in Divrei Yom Moshe, don't believe. It's very fine. Why do you waste my time, right? It was a nice story. But he said, don't believe. Well, it's in Yalka Shimoni, which is a very credible book. But he says, don't believe. And says Ibn Ezra, I want to tell you something. Only what's written in the Navi and what's written in the Gemara, right? That's all I think you believe. Like, call Savish, like a soon, Navi, Muhammad, Pika, about Amos, my God. Any other book is apocryphal. They don't believe anything else. And he says, and I'll give you another example. Don't believe anything that Elder Adani says either. So he just happened to, the two things that we are talking about, he just randomly connects them. It was random, and he connects them. He says, don't listen to the Divrei Hayamim of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, which is that whole wonderful story we said. And he said, also, in another book called Safe is Rubavo, and, right. So basically, Ibn Ezra gave him a, didn't give him a likes. He didn't give him a likes. He gave him, he gave him a thumbs down over there. But, I say, Ibn Ezra, right, because, Besides the fact that Elder Dudley had halachas from him, he was a chronolo- uh, he, had, he had a history book, uh, chronology of, uh, of, of his people. Anyway, be it as it may, most Rishonim did think Elder Hadani is credible. So, I'm excited. We have so far three options. The Kebernagist, they come, the 
the, the Ethiopians come from Shlom and Sheba. Option two, somehow other Maisha made his grandchildren, somehow other got with Sheba done. This is by the time of, right when they went to Eretz, all the time of the Exodus. Three, which is the first one that we saw in Chazal. Other Dani is the time of Chazal, right? I don't mean the Gemara, but in the time of Rishonim. He gives a, a, that they, they, they absconded, they ran away from Eretz, all when they had the fight of Rechavim and Yerav. Now, Rabbi Isai, we haven't even started here. But I, I just need to, we're going to end over here, we're going to continue next week, but I need to get something very, very clear here. I mentioned to you the book, The Keber Nagas. And I mentioned to you that this is nothing, this is a, this is a national uh, legend lore book of, of Ethiopia. How does this all come about? In 1270, there was a dynasty called the Zagwa dynasty who was ruling in Ethiopia. And they may have been Jewish. It's, it's not clear at all what their affiliations were. They clearly liked Jews. That's clear. There was a queen there called Queen Judas. It's, it's a whole machoik is exactly what they were. But in 1270, they were ousted by some fellow, which I can't even pronounce his name, but basically by the Aksumite dynasty. The Aksumite dynasty ousted these other guys. Now the Aksumite dynasty wanted to give themselves a legitimacy. They wanted to show that they deserve to be royalty. They're the ones who created this book called the Negbernakis. They're the ones who created the, the, this legend that they come from Shlomo HaMelech and Sheba. Meaning, the royal family, which until 1974 was called the, Sal the Sal Salamanic dynasty, the Salamanic dynasty in Ethiopia ruled for 700 years. If you look at the royal family emblem, they have a big cross and they got a big star of David. So what I'm trying to bring here, not the, all the Ethiopians, all the Ethiopians, at least the Ethiopian royalty, felt they were from Shlomo Amela. Now, who was the last emperor? Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie, right? Now, if you know anything about an African religion called Rastafarian, Rastafari, Rastafari believed that this guy, Haile Selassie, who was the last emperor of the Salmanic dynasty, was sort of a god, sort of a, uh, I can't even say it, but a deity. Who was the famous, who was the most famous Rastafarian? Bob Marley, Bob Marley. So he believed that this guy, Haile Selassie, was some type of deity, and they served him. We're talking about in the 1970s. Now, so we got Haile Selassie, who believes he's from Solomon, who believes he's from Shlomo Melech, and that gives him credence. So what happened to Mr. Uh, Haile Selassie? Well, in 1974, he got ousted by communism, and, or, uh, by Marxists, and Ethiopia in 1974 turned into a communist uh, country, which had a very bad effect on the Jews. And in 1975, Haile Selassie got murdered. So what I see here to be a deity, it says it's got an occupational ha hazard. The last deity got killed on a crucifix. This one got uh, assassinated. It's not such, it's not such an ay ay job. I would, I suggest you just remain an Avrik and Kailo. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a little dangerous over here. These, these deities over here. Anyway, but what I, what I, what I, what I want to show you over here is this. If you talk to a, a better Israel Jew, he knows all this. Most of them, some of them don't know this, but most of them know that on the contrary, they don't want to say they came from Sheba and Shlomo. That's what the Christians say. That's what the royalty say. They don't want to ascribe to this legend because what happened was most of Ethiopian is Christian and they associate with this legend. Again, I don't know if they say all of them are from that or the royalty is from that. So most better Israel Jews would say, we have nothing to do with that. We hold we're from Dun. Right now, I've read a lot about this. 
some better Israel Jews say no. It's true that they are all from Shlomo and Sheba, but 90% became Christians and we remain. We remain true. Right? But most don't say that. And now, listen nowadays, most say they came, they come from Dun. So, Rabbi Sai, we have just started. We ha I can't continue now. We are, we'll need at least another hour to just because we haven't we haven't started. We have to know. So, okay. So we have all these legends. We have Elder Hadani. Fine. But bottom line is, what do we say? Are uh, the better Israel? Yes, Jewish or not Jewish? Right. So you'll be surprised. The, already in the 1500s, the Batanur talks about this. The Ritbaz talks about this. Many chew us about this from hundreds of years ago and we will continue Amir Tashem next week.